Hello, my name is Sam Feltham. I'm the Director of the Public Health Collaboration and welcome to the PHC Virtual Conference 2020. The coronavirus has changed all of our lives, but where there's an obstacle, there's also an opportunity. And that opportunity comes in the guise of this virtual conference. Earlier this year, we had to postpone our two main events, the annual conference and the Real Food Rocks Festival until next year. These events allow us to connect, learn and grow, but they also help us raise crucial funds for the PHC to continue. With that in mind, and before we let the next presenter speak, this virtual conference is 100% free for all. But if you find the content valuable today, then please consider donating £2 or whatever you can afford through the Total Giving website via www.phcuk.org forward slash donate. Or if you're in the UK, you can simply text PHC to 70660 to donate £2 directly from your phone. We hope you enjoy the conference from wherever you are in the world, and be sure to get involved in the civil conversation on the comments section here on YouTube or via the hashtag PHCVCon2020 on Twitter, Facebook and Instagram. Thanks for your support, take care and stay safe. Hello, I'm John and I am the Public Health Collaboration Ambassador for Winchcombe in North Gloucestershire. I'm not medically qualified in any way and nothing I say here should be taken as personalised medical advice. You can only get that from your own doctor who has examined you and knows your medical history. In my early days I was slim and healthy and as I got older and fatter, I became less healthy until I came to my senses eventually and became slimmer again and healthier than I deserved to be given my intervening history. It all started to go wrong when I left home and my mother's home cooking in my early 20s. I moved into a bachelor flat where I catered for myself as best I could, but fortunately there was a staff restaurant at work where I at least got a substantial lunch five days a week. That ended when I married and returned to home cooking. Uh, as I settled into my sedentary occupation, I became less and less physically active, but by way of compensation, I became more able to afford luxuries like eating out and drinking. And it wasn't really surprising that I started to gain weight. As if that wasn't bad enough, my job took me to America for three years where I gained even more weight. This did start to concern me and several times I lost a little weight, but always before too long put it back on and usually with a little bit extra. By the time I returned to the UK, I had lost some weight compared to my uh, heaviest weight while I was in America but I still retained some of those American eating habits. And two or three years after getting back, I was diagnosed with type two diabetes. This didn't seem to be a very big deal in those days. Cure was simply a bit of diet and exercise. And I immediately embarked on yet another of my low fat, low calorie diets. And with the added impetus of the diagnosis, 
I stuck to it for slightly longer than usual. I lost three stone in four months. And at my next blood glucose review, the blood glucose levels had significantly improved. Job seemed to have been done. But of course it wasn't. This turned out, although slightly longer than usual, just another of my yo-yo diets. And the poor glucose control got worse. I accepted the oral medication I was being urged to take, but despite that, I started then to feel tingling and numbness in the feet. My eyesight started to get worse. Eventually, a few years later, I think I was technically blind and this was only resolved by some extensive surgery. At the same time, I started developing symptoms of chronic kidney disease although I was blissfully unaware at the time of how serious that would turn out to be. Indeed, some years later, when I developed a benign enlarged prostate um, and was waiting for surgery to resolve it, I suffered a series of urinary infections which accelerated decline in my kidney function and that never recovered. And I was getting more and more tired more and more of the time. And after a few decades of this, I chanced across an article which, in which some doctors were claiming it was possible to reverse type 2 diabetes, albeit for some people and in some circumstances. But this was completely opposite to what I'd been told many times by my doctors and diabetes nurses. So I did some further research which is really just a fancy way of sitting and Googling on the by then well-established internet and found more details of the work of professors Mike, uh, Roy Taylor and Mike Lean, who with Diabetes UK were conducting a large study in the north of England and Scotland where GPs patients were being put on an extremely low calorie diet and were losing substantial amounts of weight. And before even the weight became noticeable, they were seen to put type 2 diabetes into remission and returning to quite normal blood glucose levels. Around about the same time, I bought a book by Dr. David Cavan about reversing type 2 diabetes. And David um, had been uh, an endocrinologist, diabetes specialist for many years in Bournemouth and at that time was then uh, the director of the International Diabetes Federation, developing policies for treatment of diabetes worldwide. In Canada, a kidney specialist, Dr. Jason Fung, and his colleague, Megan Rame, also clinical researcher and educator, were giving their kidney patients advice about diet, which was improving the diabetes and obesity that so many of them suffered from. And, in that way was slowing the progression of their kidney disease. In the UK in the Northwest, GP Dr. David Unwin and his clinical psychologist wife, Dr. Jen Unwin, were achieving quite remarkable results by offering patients the option of trying dietary changes before being put on to the inevitably lifelong medication and with a little bit of careful explanation of the potential benefits, uh, every patient since then has chosen to try changing diet before going on to tablets. As well as these little gems that I was sifting out of the internet, there was far much more information that seemed doubtful, misleading, even downright dangerous. And a lot of it I dismissed very quickly without reading the full details. One such article that almost suffered the same fate um, was a report of a rather crazy fitness uh, fanatic and personal trainer who was conducting what seemed to be very reckless self-experiments and was trying out extremes of eating uh, and exercising vigorously at the same time. He produced a book as a result of his uh, studies uh, called Slimology, obviously aimed at the weight loss market, but it contained a lot of good science, but
bit of psychology, a bit of uh, philosophy, and it all seemed to make perfect sense to me. And put together with the other things I'd been learning, it encouraged me to experiment on myself a little. So I embarked once again on a severe low fat, low calorie diet. And with the added motivation of the possibility of improving my diabetes control, I stuck with it for a bit longer than usual. And my blood glucose started to go down. And as time went on, I needed less and less of the diabetes tablets that were prescribed for me, eventually stopping all of them altogether. And although my main aim was to control glucose, I was losing weight as well as a beneficial side effect. And as time went on and I was adapting what I was eating more, the hunger and cravings lessened significantly. Also, as time went on, I found my blood pressure was getting lower and lower to the point where I had to stop taking blood pressure medicines. As well as searching the internet, I started buying and reading books. One of the early ones was The Obesity Code by Dr. Jason Fung, which also included a lot of information relevant to diabetes. Later on, he brought out another book, The Diabetes Code, which uh, did repeat a lot of the information in The Obesity Code. But for me, that was a good thing because I was then reading for a second time several things I'd forgotten or hadn't appreciated the significance of at the first reading. And later, in collaboration with another doctor, Jason produced a book called The Longevity Solution, because people were noticing that not only were the low carbohydrate diets they were then recommending, uh, not only were they beneficial for diabetes and obesity, but improvements were being noticed, anecdotally, admittedly, in other chronic illnesses. It had long been known that epilepsy was helped by a lower carbohydrate diet before modern medicines were produced and uh, were much easier to administer. But improvements in things like arthritis and rheumatism, even possibly dementia, were being noticed. And there seemed to be great potential for not only prolonging people's lives, but also prolonging the part of it in which they were physically and mentally active and able to enjoy life. So encouraged by this, I was gradually being converted into a low carbohydrate frame of mind. And with the support, as in everything for the last 55 years from my wife, Lynn, I stuck to it. And as my learning increased, I found out not only was it important what I ate, more so than how much I ate, but it was important to time the meals. So there was a long enough gap between eating for the body to take care of the various housekeeping chores and cleaning itself up ready for the next onslaught of food. And Jason explained this in great detail in a book called The Complete Guide to Fasting. And later on, there was a, another book that he produced in collaboration with Megan Ramos and with a patient, Eve Mayer. And between the three of them, with the research view, the clinical practice view, and the patient experience view, it makes a very readable um, recap of everything that I'd ever learned about intermittent fasting. And in my case, because I'd already done a lot of the groundwork with the old fashioned low fat, low calorie diet, I didn't have to fast extremely. Uh, some people with a lot of weight to lose find they benefit from going without eating um, for two or three days or more. Uh, but that wasn't necessary for me. Usually now I refrain from eating for about 18 hours in every 24. And my one or two meals in a day are taken usually um, starting at about 1 p.m. and finishing at uh, 6, 7 p.m. And I settled into routine of having lunch and then dinner in the early evening. 
Uh, more recently, I'm experimenting by trying to move my food earlier in the day because I'm still feeling quite full up by the time I go to bed at night. And that seems to be making a difference, but it's too early to tell. As I became increasingly aware of information that could help me, other credible sources cropped up just at the right time. The most important, I think, being the formation of the public health collaboration and the increasing awareness of websites like diabetes.co.uk, and not to be confused with Diabetes UK, which was at the time apparently telling exactly the opposite story, and the dietdoctor.com, which together provided lots of free information, as well as some other sites which were offering information and programs for payment. Through the PHC, I met Dr. Ian Lake, who practices as a GP in Gloucestershire, and his practice then was about 20 to 30 miles away from where we live. And since meeting Ian, I've never looked back. He's been a constant source of information, motivation, and reinforcement. At the first PHC conference, uh, Lynn and I met Argent and Charlotte and learned more about the developing low carb program. And through Ian, we were introduced to Dr. Samantha Kwok at the Aspen Medical Practice in Gloucester, who is achieving remarkable results by educating her diabetes patients in the low carbohydrate diet and influencing more and more doctors in the county, despite at times uh, some quite strong opposition from the local medical establishment. All of this good news was for me tempered by some bad news. I achieved my objective of putting my type two diabetes into remission but the chronic kidney disease, which had been a large part of my motivation for trying to change my diet, persisted. And I eventually had to progress to dialysis, first hemodialysis at a center 20 miles away, three times a week, and then latterly at home overnight, every day. I was lucky enough to get on the waiting list for a kidney transplant. The surgeon who assessed my suitability told me that his eyes lit up when he saw how slim I was because that meant in his eyes I would make a good recovery after surgery. I told him how I'd become so slim through dietary changes and he said yes, during the first 30 years of his life when he lived in India, he'd noticed that the older people tended to eat only once or twice a day. Well, the operation to transplant a kidney was a success. The dialysis was over and I was slowly recovering when an adverse reaction developed to one of the many medications I had to take to protect the newly transplanted kidney. I suffered a severe acid reflux, which burned my esophagus so badly, it was far too painful to swallow food or even liquids. And over a two week period, I became severely dehydrated and lost 10 kilos in weight, which put me back into the hospital for a couple of weeks. On release from the hospital, I was using a wheelchair for almost a month as I slowly regained my strength. And part of that recovery was to basically eat anything I could swallow and not pay too much attention to the carbohydrate content. My blood glucose started to rise. The kidney transplant outpatient clinic told me not to worry. That was easily treatable with tablets and if necessary with insulin injections. That got my attention. So I redoubled my efforts to refeed myself, but with as little carbohydrate as possible. And the blood glucose started to come back down and there was no more talk of medicines or insulin and my blood glucose levels have largely stayed in the non-diabetic range ever since. And so I think low carbohydrate did aid my recovery. 
I've been trying to lose weight on and off for a long time. And this is just a snapshot of uh, recent years where I was realizing the importance of monitoring closely what was happening so that I could react and try to change my diet accordingly. On the left in 2006, I was weighing in at about 18 stone, 114 kilos, uh, which was lighter than I had been at my heaviest in America when I must have reached over 22 stone, 140 kilos. And with yet another low fat, low calorie diet, I quite quickly got my weight down. And with it, the blood glucose came tumbling down too. Then, as before so many times, the weight started creeping back up. The blood glucose went back up in synchronization. And I was back to the yo-yo pattern. Until, interestingly, around the middle of the chart, in about 2011 onwards, the weight was still trending upwards, but the blood glucose wasn't to the same extent. If anything, was going slightly down. But I was also getting tired of all the meticulous record keeping, so the blood glucose wasn't as constantly monitored as I would have liked. However, in 2012, increasingly worried by the kidney disease, I made another effort with another low calorie, low fat diet, got quite a bit of weight loss quite quickly and improved the glucose, mostly by making it more stable, very close to the non-diabetic range with fewer excursions uh, due to feasting at uh, holidays and festivals. And then a year later, when I was learning more about what to eat and increasingly reducing my carbohydrates, there was another even steeper uh, weight loss over a short period. And this seemed to really solidify the stability of my blood glucose. Um, in fact, I'd been discharged from the diabetes clinic at the local hospital because the endocrinologist said I was no longer diabetic. Now, I think by that she meant my blood glucose was controlled because, as we well know, um, diabetes doesn't really go away. It just becomes better controlled. The good news for me was this was all done with eating real food. And these are pictures of meals I've actually eaten, mostly home cooked, but some in restaurants where I just pick and choose carefully off the standard menu. And without low carb, I don't think I would be here to tell the tale today. So what has it ever done for me? Well, our two older grandchildren have developed in front of my eyes from two-year-old toddlers into healthy, thriving eight-year-olds in that photo. They're now nine going on ten. And I wouldn't have seen them develop over those years, I think. Nor would I have ever known about the younger sisters each of them now has. So in return, what can I do for low carb? Well, my local GPs have been very supportive in providing necessary blood tests, which allowed me to enroll in Jason Fung's um, online dietary advice clinic because he wouldn't let me in that unless I could assure him I was under supervision of my own local physician and they were very impressed with the results but I couldn't convince them that what had worked for me could be more generally applicable to some of their other patients. So I went behind their back to the chairman of the patient participation group and she listened carefully and was equally impressed but like the GP, thought that was just me and not generally applicable. Although she helpfully suggested that I perhaps take this important information I thought I had to a higher level and went away and spoke to somebody else. Or went away and spoke to anybody else or just went away. And so I did. Through the public health collaboration, I'd got to know 
a few doctors in Gloucestershire, and they were educating their patients, ensuring they were going to have continuing medical supervision from their own doctors and diabetes nurses, and also encouraging the patients to form themselves into peer support groups. And I found that I could help by going to these groups um, whenever somebody raised doubts about the sustainability of what they could see was clearly working for them, then I was able to say a few words about how long I'd been doing it and how easy I now found it to sustain and how enjoyable it was. And I think this helped. It made me feel good because I was managing to pass on some information that might be useful to other people. But also unexpectedly, I benefited because every time a new member asked a seemingly very naive question, it uh, made me think, maybe I'd not heard that question before. Maybe I hadn't really considered the significance of such a, a minor question. And this kept me thirsty for more and more knowledge, uh, made me realize that no matter how much I thought I'd improved, there was always room for further improvement. I have been a member of the local NHS Hospitals Trust for a long time. Their public engagement largely consists of holding meetings to inform the public of how well they were doing and their plans for the future. Um, but the local mental health trust and community care trust were merging and in that exercise, they were quite proactive in publicizing their plans to the public and in soliciting feedback from the public, getting the views of what they were calling the service users. And somehow as a result of these efforts, Lynn and I ended up in their expert by experience program. Uh, I as a patient, Lynn as a carer, and although my only expertise is in being ill, they seem to think that was useful. Uh, and some of the experts by experience were quite frank in uh, conveying their opinions of the service to the commissioners. I tried to be a little more collaborative, uh, turned up smartly dressed and was very polite to everybody. And I think as a result of that, I was recently invited to be part of a recruitment panel interviewing candidates to be head of dietetics for the trust, which I found very exciting. Unfortunately, with the COVID virus, I had to excuse myself from that duty because I thought even before the government guidelines, it would be unwise for me with my suppressed immunity to be in a smallish room with a number of strangers for any time. And I, I believe the panel didn't go ahead and schedule it anyway once the guidelines came out. I also attended a meeting where the clinical commissioning group were outlining to the public their plans to reorganize GPs into primary care networks. And during the coffee break, I had conversation with the head of the CCG. Uh, she was very interested in my story of remission from type two diabetes because she was reading Michael Mosley's 5-2 diet book at the time. And I could see that it was making an impression on her. She told me, it, she was finding it very difficult to change long ingrained habits within the commissioners and clinicians. I was disappointed, but didn't surprise me. Although later on thinking it over, I realized that with her at the top, willing to try and change things from the top down and people like me kicking the ankles of the establishment at the bottom, eventually we could meet in the middle. So I'm more confident now that times are changing and even dare to hope that the pace of change is accelerating. So quick questions. Do I miss chips? No, there are plenty of other delicious things I can eat that don't harm me like chips and stuff. What have I learned? Well, for me, carbohydrate restriction, intermittent fasting and peer support groups. What would I teach? Wouldn't presume to teach anybody anything, but I hope by telling my story, they would be inspired to consider what they can do for themselves to suit their individual situation and improve their outcome. 
Where can I get ongoing support? From the healthcare professionals who first go for your education and who should be arranging regular scheduled reviews, um, but also from the people who surround you and with whom you spend most of your time. So the strongest support comes from the people who love you. So start by loving yourself.